Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this month's Duramat webinar. Um, we've got a lot of great content to cover today, so I'm going to run through the housekeeping slides real quick, and then we can get started. Um, we're hosting on Zoom this month. Everyone's going to be muted. Um, there are two options for audio. You're going to default to computer audio, um, but if you're having issues with that, telephone audio is a really good backup option. Uh, you should have an audio or mute button at the bottom of your screen. You can click the up arrow next to that and choose switch audio if you're having issues. Um, if you're having any issues with your audio or other technical issues, just message me, Harrison Dreeves, the host, using the chat panel. I'm happy to walk you through any issues and we'll try to get them resolved. Um, as I said, everyone's muted, so we're going to be doing Q&A using the Q&A panel. So at any point during the webinar, you can type in your questions for the speakers in the Q&A panel. Um, and we will do our best to get to as many of those as we can with the time we've got left at the end of the webinar. With that, I'll hand it over to Teresa Barnes uh, to introduce today's speakers. Teresa? All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I am the director of Duramat and your host for today's webinar. And I wanna say thanks for attending this uh, with us in November. Um, we are gonna take a break from webinars next month and we'll pick up again in the new year. As you all know, we hold these webinars monthly on a variety of different topics with the goal of providing information about what we do in Duramat and other topics that inform and influence Duramat work. If you are interested in finding out more about Duramat and our research portfolio, please visit our website at www.duramat.org. Um, I'd like to welcome our speakers today, our, uh, some two of the guys who helped us get Duramat off the ground from my group at NREL, Drs. Peter Hacke and David Miller. They'll be presenting on combined accelerated stress testing of PV modules and BOSS components, um, which involves some new capabilities and casts and applications to new problems that we're, we're pretty excited about. Dave and Peter have been working in PV reliability for many years in areas ranging from materials durability to potential induced degradation and even inverters. Um, they're both very well known for their work, um, both academically and also in the standards community um, helping to actually implement some of this learning into real world testing. So with that, I'll let Peter get us started. And Peter, you can pull up your screen whenever you're ready. Sure thing. I've got the uh, message. You cannot start screen sharing while others are part participating. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Give it another shot. There we go. Yep, it's up. Great. This talk is Combined Accelerated Stress Testing, PV Modules and BOS Components. I'll be talking about, well, after an introduction, I'll be talking about PV modules that we test, and then David Miller will um, carry on with balance of system components. So what is Combined Accelerated Stress Testing? It's a stress test where we combine stress factors of the natural environment, heat, light, humidity, mechanical pressure, system voltage. And we can also do in situ metrology. And the idea here is to discover potential weaknesses in module designs, both known and not a priori recognized to reduce risk, accelerate time to market, bankability, reduce costly over-design and lower the levelized cost of electricity. Got a question a while back and I wanna use this platform to expand on it. What can combined accelerated stress testing find that other tests won't find? So there's a couple of ways to answer that, and I'm going to do it in two ways. The first is with a story about a PID. In 1978, a JPL uh, published about the effects of system voltage, and they found through a, you know, a, an apparatus very similar to what we use today for PID testing, they had changes in resistance, shunt resistance, series resistance, what have you, the uh, before and after are shown here. And also in, in 1985, JPL continued with crystal silicon modules to show as a function of Coulomb's past degradation. In 2005, Rick Swanson uh, published about the surface polarization effect in high efficiency solar cells. They also said in those very same presentations that a similar effect but to a lesser degree was observed in conventional modules. Quite often I was hearing among people around me in the industry, oh, they won't happen to our cells, they're different. In 2008, Carl Osterwald published that um, 
um, they tried to get some kind of voltage bias test into the standards, but it was deemed too strenuous. So in fact, it was ignored, maybe because they couldn't pass the testing, or it's too new, we need to study it further. So a lot of excuses were given. However, in 2011, various module makers said, our modules are down 40%, we think it's PID. So in the 2015, um, 37 years after the first PID type tests were created, we had a, a tech spec and finally in 2021, uh, we have it in the qualification test. It isn't that tests don't exist, it's just that we failed to choose them because of bias, pun intended. The second answer is, um, well, combined accelerated stress testing does find other, you know, you can use other tests to determine uh, the failure modes, but in fact, there, there are quite a number of them that are required. So for example, if you wanna look at fatigue, breakage, which can eventually lead to burns, you need five different tests. And that's really included in combined accelerated stress testing, light induced degradation. Uh, you have uh, an additional, um, um, well, if we do the sum total, we have six uh, existing tests plus uh, two missing tests. Uh, in thin films, for example, uh, we're just creating a standard now for uh, uh, you know, uh, getting good light induced degradation. For yellowing, a module packaging and optical losses, uh, we have a, a general test, um, but uh, in, in 62788-7-2, but it, it doesn't include electrical bias and it's, uh, the coupon is not precisely defined. A backsheet cracking, well, there's a test for it. Um, DuPont has been a pioneer of that, but involves you know, a, a number of different stress sequences. Uh, and if you add it all up, uh, we have 11 existing I, IC tests plus three missing tests. Corrosion, cell front delamination. Uh, there's a number of tests out there, uh, some existing, some missing, and potential induced degradation. Well, we're just... Uh, you know, getting that finally standardized in the last couple of years, uh, but uh, they're still missing uh, the factor of light and voltage simultaneously to understand if it's really going to happen. So if we add it all up, uh, there's, you have to do 16 IEC type tests, plus there's six missing tests, that's to say not standardized or um, in process of being standard, standardized for a uh, for the common known mechanisms versus one comprehensive combined accelerated stress test. And you can find a more in the literature about how stress factors combine and why it's necessary to do that. And we have three, three different items here, a publication, uh, a technical report, which is basically a review document and this presentation in the 2019 PVRW does a pretty good job of explaining what I just showed in more detail. So, um, as we're motivated here, we'd like to, for motivation, we'd, we'd like to see, um, we'd like to reproduce the numerous fuel failures seen in modules that pass qualification testing, um, and, but we create tests significantly after failure modes have been found in the field, like I showed for PID, all of 37 years after. There's numerous parallel tests getting time consuming expensive and people don't know exactly which test to choose. Uh, stakeholders buying into new technologies, materials and designs uh, incur risk, such as risk of new materials like different cell types, risk from incremental changes like going to thinner cells and risk from failure of critical parts like an edge seal. Um, PV module reliability standards are subject and limited to the interest of those seeking to initiate the standards. And they only move forward when all of industry understands and can solve the problem. So we see uh, a room for improvement here and that's why combined accelerated stress testing is introduced. So uh, in our previous literature, we've discussed the equipment in a uh, uh, 2018 uh, IEEE uh, paper. Uh, we've discussed how indentation hardness can be used to, to show how uh, you know, cracking PVDF is associated with embrittlement. Again, indentation hardness uh, showed that. It's been reproduced by a number of uh, other techniques. Uh, we've shown here uh, how uh, 
different stress factors combine and in a combined accelerated stress testing, we're seeking to represent the sample, the factors of the natural environment and the combination that they see in natural environment. And that's uh, discussed here. So we've also published how uh, combined accelerated stress testing finds the degradation polyamide and PVDF cracking that's seen in the field, uh, pretty much out of the box of the combined accelerated stress testing. Uh, we've shown how uh, the in situ electroluminescence uh, can show uh, how uh, cracks or disconnects may exist as a function of temperature from minus 40 to 80 degrees C. And this, been, this has been reproduced in a number of publications in and out of Duramat. We've shown the acceleration factors. I'll talk a little bit more about that in this talk. And uh, we've discussed here in uh, this very forum how uh, the, you know, the cost benefits of it. And you know, one of the important outputs out of that March webinar in 2020 was the cost of combined accelerated stress testing is equivalent to, you know, in scale, equivalent to the extended tests that industry provides right now, where multiple modules through multiple tests are performed. Um, a little bit more about the acceleration factors. Uh, we published uh, this in uh, the 2021 PVRW, but uh, you know, we're going through a winter, uh, which simulates cold storage. We go through a spring with freeze-thaw cycles. We go through a tropical sequence, which is based on ASTM D7869, which finds failures in paints and coatings. And we do a, a temperature cycling with light tests called high desert. And the acceleration factors depend on the mechanism, but uh, you know, it's on the order of uh, 14 uh, for electrochemical degradation, uh, basically, uh, Electro, electrolytic corrosion up to 426 uh, for PET. So there's a range and there's really nothing we can do about that because different uh, degradation processes have different activation energies. So I'm gonna move now uh, to recent results um, after this uh, review of some of our previous results. And uh, what we're doing here is two things. We're looking at uh, conventional glass EVA modules with back sheets, uh, different back sheet samples from DuPont showing problems with the inner layer core that have been found in the field. A PET and an FEVE type uh, back sheet are, are used. And the second uh, set of results I'm gonna discuss is a project with uh, Professor Manny's group at ASU testing uh, substrate and encapsulants. Specifically, the encapsulants are polyolefin with um, an EVA with a transparent back sheet a glass and a white back sheet. So it's a two by three matrix of, of samples. So I'm gonna go through these uh, two different uh, <coughs> experiments and their results. The first, the inner layer back sheet samples from DuPont. So they published how a PET and an FEVE type back sheet were found to uh, fail in the field. In this example here, uh, the FEVE was observed to fail after nine years in the field with, uh, with cracking. And the, uh, the PET um, was found uh, also to have uh, failed nine year, after nine years in the field with yellowing as well as cracking. So let's look at uh, the PET results first. So we uh, ran uh, the PET, well, I, I should say, before getting into the PET results, what we're looking again is the cast cycle and the sequence that they went through, the winter, spring, tropical desert, and then back again. And we did this uh, seven times. So the PET one. Well, what we found initially, uh, the four cell mini modules that we use, um, you know, it looked good. Uh, and uh, slowly in time, um, we found yellowing under, well, I should say on top of the junction box. And eventually we could see cracking. So if you can see my cursor here, we've got cracks developing there, there, there. And we think about this, about why this could be happening under the junction box. Of course, the most obvious uh, or the first answer that comes to mind is, well, it's a little bit hotter under the junction box because it provides some insulation as the light hits it in the combined accelerated stress testing. But we, we also wanted to you know, see if there was anything else going on. So we look at the electroluminescence and here we're looking at 
ex situ elect electroluminescence at room temperature. Here's the initial and the final. And if there's wear and tear, as uh, we stress test the modules, thermal cycling, loading, uh, that's going, uh, mechanical loading going on. So uh, cracks do develop. And uh, the main thing that falls here, we find, is the fill factor. But there's no major disconnects. Uh, there's no uh, major, uh, you know, even electroluminescence, which is highly contrasting of areas that fall off due to open circuits. We, we really don't see too much. Um, and that's also true at a various temperatures. So here uh, we're looking in situ electroluminescence here at room temperature and here at minus 20 degrees. And it's a fairly similar story. We don't see uh, much of a, uh, you know, any important areas dropping out. Well, this line here is actually a string, um, not, uh, not a crack, this line here. So there's really no connection problems at low temperature either. Therm thermography, which shows us potential hot spots, is shown here, and we're looking uh, at uh, room temperature without any current, ISC and 1.8 ISC at, at two minutes. And we're seeing no, no connection problems leading to localized overheating, like around the junction box or anything. <clears throat> so I think the, the initial uh, proposition whereby, you know, this yellowing and cracking has something to do with, with the junction box still stands. Uh, the issue uh, is seen reproduced. Uh, in product that uh, showed this failure after nine years in the field. And it also uh, highlights the necessity of using representative samples, including a J-box, J its penetrations, um, penetrations of the, uh, that we in introduce into the back sheet allow for different moisture ingress. And of course, the heating associated with the junction box is, is uh, under light is representative. So this, Using representative samples, a feature of combined accelerated stress testing where we use four cell mini modules permits observation of potential problems. So next we're moving to the FEVE type sample. And um, here's the initial on the left. And on the right is after uh, seven cycles. And what we're seeing is a lot of embrittlement uh, on the, uh, the perimeter. Um, we don't see any major uh, cracking at this point in time, but we will do uh, further uh, stress testing to see if uh, we can reproduce the kind of fractures that are seen in the back sheet after nine years in the field. And we may also do indentation hardness, which produces cracks at the uh, edges of the indentation. And also we can find um, changes in the displacement versus time curves as materials in brittle. So th there's other tests we can consider doing as well. So uh, that's the results for the, the PET and the FEV, FEVE um, back sheet so far. And I'd like to move to um, the second of the two important results that I've got to show today. And that's the two by three matrix of polyolefin and ethyl vinyl acetate EVA um, encapsulant with um, transparent back sheet, glass in the back, and white back sheet. So this is only after two rounds of, of combined accelerated stress testing. And already, what we can see is in the glass glass modules, fairly uh, significant grid finger line breaks. So this has got some, some commonalities with another Duramat project out of ASU. Mary, Marianne Bertoni's group is showing the greatest cell stress in silicon in glass glass modules, whether it be a polyolefin or EVA. Although maybe the, the EVA in this case is showing somewhat higher stress. So this is in the cell using the x-ray topography. So it is possible that uh, the, the commonalities we see, uh, that's to say higher stress and the wafer are associated with 
and the grid finger breaks. Another thing we did with these uh, mini modules, comparing uh, the EVA and the different substrates um, is look at the leakage current and look for degradation by PID shunting or PID polarization. So not too unexpectedly, the uh, polyolefin encapsulant type back sheets, so less leakage current, about an order of magnitude less than those with the EVA. In this particular experiment, we didn't see a great deal of difference or systematic difference in leakage current between the different substrates, whether it be glass, transparent back sheet, or um, I think I made a mistake here, but a uh, uh, white back sheet. Just notice that. So no, no special uh, difference in, in a substrate, but a great deal of differences associated with the leakage current. So we look at these uh, EVA encapsulated modules and um, look at the performance over time. And what we're seeing um, is no, no real um, loss in, in, in fill factor uh, in low light. Um, well, we're, we're not really seeing any important drop in um, In, uh, in, in power performance uh, fill factor, and we're, we're no, not seeing any particular uh, polarization as evidenced by drop in VOC and ISC. So this uh, big elephant in the room is associated with the, the modules dropping, but you can see um, in the low light fill factor, which we might look at for evidence of uh, PID shunting, is that it's fairly stable before the break and fairly stable after the break. So, you know, that's why I say uh, it doesn't look like PID shunting. And, uh, you know, VOC um, here, you know, other than the situation where you have the break is uh, fairly, fairly consistent, doesn't move beyond half a percent. So I think we have to consider here that, uh, you know, combined accelerated stress testing uses the factor of light, which can, which will uh, influence whether you see a PID or not. Um, because um, PID has a, a, a neutralizing, excuse me, uh, light has a neutralizing effect on, on PID. So it's, it's, uh, it highlights the importance of using the stress factors of the natural environment to see if you've got a problem or not. Another element of uh, the experiment using the different back sheets and through the different kinds of testing is when we examine a bleaching, browning, photoluminescence. So what we're looking at here is um, the photoluminescence signature after combined accelerated stress testing and the extent to which you have uh, this luminescent region. And we're looking at it, that same pattern over a couple of different test types. And you'll see uh, that uh, this this luminescent this this brighter area you know is is highlighted with the dimensional bar here, and we can see that uh, the combined accelerated stress testing gives a, a fairly similar dimension to what you might see in the uh, out, outdoor stress testing, vis-a-vis -vis this uh, uh, marker here. However, in under just UVA lights, the uh, this luminescent region is much smaller, you know, indicating that um, the combined accelerated stress testing does a, a better job at matching the kind of degradation signatures uh, that you get in the natural environment than a straight UVA test. So uh, now I'd like to uh, discuss very briefly our, our thinking about, you know, future work. Uh, full-size modules, uh, we call it CAS 2.0. And, and there's major, if, uh, maybe six major subsystems, the chamber, uh, and that, you know, designs have been proposed and that's okay, no big problem. Full spectrum lights, we're looking for xenon lamps up to 1.6 suns. We are in discussion with vendors it's, and it's looking promising, but it's not something you buy off the shelf. Then the mechanical stress testing for simulated wind loading, and uh, 
system voltage, uh, water spray, and controlled diagnostics. Controlled diagnostics and data collection are all okay. It's very similar to what we do now. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the mechanical stress for simulated wind loading. And that's shown here. Um, so what we seek to do is, uh, you know, as we represent the factors of the natural environment is, is to include, you know, the kind of vibrations that the wind might um, cause on modules, whether on the racking or on, you know, the wind resistance of the module itself. And we're looking to be representative. You know, the frame is unconstrained. It can flex and vibrate, unlike, you know, some other mechanisms that are out there to stress test modules under loading. And uh, we also seek it to be capable of being put in cast you know, actuating a motor can exist ex situ of the chamber. So what we've got is a little uh, a vibrating rotary electrical uh, motor here. And uh, it transmits the, uh, the vibration through these uh, poles. So this uh, could be ex situ of the chamber. And here are some results with a, a laser um, extensionometer, uh, one in the middle of the module at the blue and um, another one at the edge of the module right under the mount over the mount, I should say, this vertical bar. And we can see that um, the, uh, um, that just a small amount of displacement uh, at the mount um, leads to a fairly big swing in the uh, center of the module. So this is uh, the, the dynamic mechanical uh, cycling uh, that we propose here. And uh, let's show this in action. Let's see if we can run DMC. So here, what we're looking at is uh, the motor vibrating. And, um, and uh, you know, I don't think there's any sound here, but um, yeah. Uh, so this is, you can see the edges of the module flexing a little bit as well. So, um, with that, I'd like to thank you for attention. And, uh, and at this point, we move on to part two of, of the uh, presentation where David Miller discusses combined accelerated stress testing. Thanks, Peter. David, if you wanna share your screen, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, let's see if this comes up. Peter, I think you have to stop your presentation first. Peter, look for a red stop button at the top of the screen. There we go. Okay. Okay, there we go. I think the video and the audio are both working now. Yeah, it looks great. Take it away. Okay, great. Great. So today we've mostly examined modules um, using the cast method, but today I'll talk about working towards components where we stress them with the simultaneous you know, factors. And specifically, we're talking about balance of system components. And by that, I mean things like connectors, cables, branch connectors are the example that I'll focus on today. Um, fuses, and these might be discrete or in a block. Um, and these sort of things have received very limited research examination. Um, but we know that there's a quantifiable replacement rate um, certainly on the time frame that might approach today's module warranties. Um, and it becomes more worrisome when you think about it, like the time frame, like a 50 years, um, which might be like the ideal Duramat sort of um, PV system lifetime. I'll point out that there's two DOE projects that are presently examining what are the components of concern, um, the occurrence of degradation and the associated costs. Um, but then, uh, speaking of that, then the consequences of degradation and failure include uh, modules, strings, inverters, even the system being offline. Um, but then also like arc faults uh, and even fires. The example shown here is a, a system that, um, a rooftop system in Italy. Um, there's relatively limited publicity in the US sort of for legal reasons. Um, but these latter consequences, they tend to be more BOS-centric um, than just the module sort of 
um, degradation that we focused on Duramac um, in recent years. Um, so generally speaking, again, CAS is typically used with mini modules. Um, so working with the BOS components, we wanted to develop the characterization methods, um, identify the sort of degradation modes that come up in CAST, and be able to distinguish bad components using CAST. Um, this would be the home run, right? Um, and there are some specific concerns that come to mind, like what are the most damaging stressors? Um, that is the environments. And the CAST sequences, they simulate these environments, right? And so that should help address that concern. Um, and then looking at the systems, the components in this particular example, they're not very rigidly mounted. Um, and that caused us to wonder if like a static load or a mechanical vibration uh, might contribute to degradation or failure. So regarding that last question, I can say that we saw that the mechanical actuation greatly affected our result. And that's summarized in this infrared image. Um, and as we go through this, Take a look for how we implement um, the benchtop test that I'll talk about. Um, there's a fixture for this. Um, what are the components that are affected? So we're not just looking at branch connectors here. We're talking about an assembly, it turns out. And then how might we further validate the result that we're seeing here? Um, we have also been looking at the topic of like junction box adhesives and potents. This will probably come up maybe another day. I don't think we'll have time for this today. Um, so the scenario here is that we were pushed by a utility provider and they were seeing something like a 30% failure rate in their power transfer chain. And they attributed this to branch connectors. Well, what are branch connectors? Um, so there's a bunch of examples shown here, but the concept is we're going from one cable to multiple cables, right? It might be two or three or more. Um, and in this scenario, failure means overheating, um, softening of the material. It's physically distorted after it's taken out of the system. Um, there's observable change in temperature, like if you're taking an infrared image while you're running the components. And the worst consequences here would be like a broken circuit, an arc, even a, a localized fire. Um, and in this presentation, the make and model of the components um, is kept confidential, so I won't let you know which one of these it exactly is, if it's any of these. Um, and then the approach here, um, we want to compare CAST, um, which I'm talking about today, to like the UL standard tests. So this is something that Mike Kempi is looking into. Um, and we approached it in CAST with the philosophy like the number and contribution of the bad components was not known. Um, so we considered all of the adjoining system components as a sample assembly. So that includes like the cable connectors um, that go to the branch connector. Um, there's a fuse, a discrete fuse that's used, uh, and then also the branch connectors themselves. And so I'll focus today on developing the fixture and the software um, using benchtop experiments. And then we're presently in the process of incorporating this into CAST um, using the dedicated fixture um, to examine multiple replicates at the same time. Um, so the fixture concept that we went with is um, what I refer to as like this yoke and push rod um, concept, right? Um, so there's like a yoke or like a strap that's actually incorporated around one of the fuses. So we pull on that and then there's a mechanism that actually pushes on the other end of the sample assembly. Um, so we chose this design concept. Another idea that we um, looked at was what we call like the wedge design. Um, where you might have a wedge in the middle that comes in and, and forces everything apart. Um, we picked the yoke and push rod concept. Um, it allows a much more complicated displacement. Um, and considering how these components were fixed in the system, I mean, they're um, sometimes placed with like cable ties or um, they could be placed with a wire or something like that. There's quite a bit of uh, mechanical flexibility um, rather than just having something that's in, you know, one direction or one dimension. Um, so if you haven't figured it out yet, the sample assembly is part of the actuation mechanism, right? It's part of the mechanism. Um, and we started with a relatively large initial deflection. We were just trying this out. And then we started to dial that back. Um, so in later uh, runs, 
we were more at like one millimeter instead of three. And then in cast, we envisioned down this back even a little bit more. Um, and then this benchtop version is actually hooked up to like a 16 RPM DC motor. It looks a bit like the, the oil pumps, right? If you're in a, a petroleum extraction field when it's running. Um, the cast version instead uses um, hydraulic actuators. Um, so these are running um, somewhat slower in practice. So <clears throat> here's the image that summarizes kind of um, the results of the benchtop experiment. So let me explain. So we started at like a 10 amp um, initial current for like the actuated or that dynamic assembly. And then we actually did double that current for the static component. So we're comparing them here kind of side by side, right? And then each day we incremented the current up by one amp uh, until we got to the point of failure. Um, and so the immediate observation then is that here and in separate examinations where we looked at one component at a time, the static assembly, it was failing at like 35 amps. And the components um, are equivalently labeled for like a 30 amp. Um, so this is doing at least what they say it should be doing. And then the dynamic assembly, um, this is actually getting much hotter in this image, right? Even though we're running half of the current, and this is failing at like 15 amps um, and reaching temperatures like 130 C. And if you compare that to the UL connector test, um, which I don't show an image of here, um, but there we're just looking at the branch connector on its own. We're running it at 37 and a half amps and it's reaching external temperatures like 44 C. So that's comparable to the static um, assembly component, right? Um, so that's comparing current wise. And then speaking of the failure mode, so the static assembly fails at the fuse. Actually, there's an internal kind of conventional com fuse component that's embedded in here. It fails in open circuits. The dynamic assembly, this fails um, at the fuse branch interface. Um, and what's going on here includes um, there's smoke coming from the components, there's localized melting of the plastic, the metal pins are discolored when you pull them apart, and there's a, a slightly increased fuse resistance. So that focused more on the fixture in the previous slide, and we're also developing the data acquisition. This is run through LabVIEW, um, and this is, um, again, through the benchtop experiments. Um, what we do is to log the current um, and voltage through the course of the experiment. Um, so we get this once for each of the sample assemblies, you know, for the multiple components at once. Um, the data has been, been averaged in one minute intervals, um, and it's actually analyzed with a bunch of statistics um, that you can look at afterwards. And then we have the option where if you click a button, there's a fast burst mode, we can log it like 100 kilohertz, which is certainly much, much faster than either the mechanical or thermal responses on any of the components in the test. Um, so the example here is from a ladder um, experiment where we were working with a deflection of one millimeter. This compares the current um, and the voltage for the static and the dynamic assemblies. Um, and here the Y scales are different um, because we wanted to show the detail of what's going on. Um, and remember that the voltage quickly becomes quite variable um, once you add the mechanical actuation to the samples. And then I'll po point out one thing. So there is a full back protection, um, meaning when the power supply uh, voltage jumps above a, a threshold, um, that will terminate the test or that will terminate the current to the samples. We started out with like a one second setting and came to be like a, a five second and now it's at like a 25 second setting. Um, so a question for the audience, and I'd love to hear your comments in the Q&A or something. What would you use here to simulate a PV inverter? Um, we know that the modern inverters can respond quite quickly if there's a problem in the system. But at the same time, operators don't like getting a lot of false events or annoying kind of false triggers. And so that might actually be dialed up to a much longer time anyways. So this now goes on to the temperature data. So we log this actually in multiple locations within the same sample assembly, um, like at the two branch connectors and then in the center of each of the fuses. And we're using discrete 
T-type thermocouples is in like a sheet package. We love to use that at, at NREL for um, verifying module temperature. We just use the same thing here. Um, and again, this is the example for later on, we were using a smaller deflection. Um, this compares the temperature for the static and the dynamic assemblies. This time we have the same Y scale to accentuate or give some sense of how much different the temperature is responding through the course of the experiment. Um, and these temperatures, they're representative. If you go in and compare the Fourier um, results, like if you zoom in and look at the pixels and stuff to the thermocouple, um, the exact hottest spot within the sample is difficult to predict or it's difficult to get your thermocouple exactly there. Um, but this certainly gives an, an order of magnitude um, sense of what's going on. Um, that said, it is helpful to monitor the temperature here because we'd like to know um, when is the onset of some sort of degradation or failure and what are the components that are affected. So we get a very different response at the components that actually are running hottest, right? So knowing the benchtop results, um, we wondered what's the phase transition temperature and what material is implied for that black deformed plastic that's used in the components in the sample assembly. And so um, we used DSC and FTIR characterization on, on age samples. Uh, I'll start first with the DSC and these are the measurements that Sonia helped us with. Um, we suspected this was like a structural polymer um, just from handling the samples beforehand. Um, and the result here suggests a glass transition temperature on the order of 143C. Um, this is an amorphous material. And this is characteristic, you'd find this like in polycarbonate. Um, and all the samples that we looked at, uh, measuring from 90 below to 200 above, um, gave similar response. Um, we looked at the cable connectors, the branch connectors, and the ends of the fuses, which are all this black plastic material. So to compare to that, um, we also did the FTR characterization. Um, I show here like a reference sample of polycarbonate um, and that's shown relative to um, samples extracted from these same components. We looked at at least two separate pieces of each of the components, and we verified both the female and male connector ends. Um, long story short, this looks like it's polycarbonate, probably containing like carbon black to stabilize it. So now let me go to the, um, the XCT um, failure analysis. So if we use this, we can essentially look through our samples or look into our samples um, at the metal pieces. It's like looking through the plastic. And here I'm comparing um, an unaged sample assembly at the branch connectors and then an unaged um, branch connector to fuse um, assembly, right? And so in the field samples, we see that there's an asymmetry um, that's not present on the unaged sample, right? Like one side is shorter than the other. In the accelerated testing samples, these are benchtop experiments, there's a deformation um, that's not present in the unaged sample. So if we think about it for a minute, um, there's a convolute spring component, and I'll show this in, in one of the slides that's coming up. This is made of copper, the forage temperature of copper is like 900 C. Well, we don't think we're getting that hot. Um, these fuse holder components, these are composed of like aluminum bronze. Um, this has a softening temperature of like 315 C maybe, um, but then there's also uh, a, a tin, silver, possibly copper solder that's used. Um, and it, there is evidence, at least in the accelerated test sample, that we're approaching those sorts of temperatures. Um, and so certainly in both of these um, samples with a history, um, we're getting hot enough to melt the plastic with the polycarbonate, um, but potentially we're getting hotter than that um, in the accelerated test. So now let's step back and talk about um, the destructive failure analysis. So after the DSC or the after the XCT, I should say. Um, so here, the first step would be to remove, meaning to mill away the external plastic. Um, we can retain that plastic like for polymer failure analysis, but really our goal here is to inspect the metal components relative to the XCT imaging. And then we can come in with like a camera microscope, SEM-EDX, um, and, and look at things like morphology and composition. Then we go back again and actually extract the convolute spring component from the female metal pin ends. Um, so the, 
the de the detail here is to um, heal away or open up so that these convolute string springs can be extracted, um, and then we inspect these using similar methods um, like we've just mentioned. So when we apply that um, sequence here, so milling away the plastic, there's a, a, an obvious discoloration from the field components. This is the one with the asymmetry. And then when we, ex when we extract the convolute springs, these are discolored, right? So that suggests that we've been at some sort of elevated temperature enabling an oxidation. Uh, and relative to the field sample, this is the sample that's been through the accelerated testing. Yes, indeed, there is a deformation um, the, in the, the solder area. Um, and then if you extract the convolute spring, here there are broken ribs uh, and also some scuff marks on the ends. And then if you compare the inside of the convolute spring, that looks like there's some wear that's been occurring um, relative to the field failed samples where you just see the, the discoloration, um, presumably from the oxidation, right? And so the big takeaway here is that we think that there's some sort of mechanical wear going on. This was from one of the earlier samples, right, with the larger deflection, by the way. Um, so presently, we're looking through the branch connectors, looking at the failure analysis of the latter experiments where we're using a one millimeter deflection. Will we see evidence of wear in these samples if we've turned down the um, actuation? We've run a set of the static uh, assembled branch connectors through a round of cast. Um, we ran that through at 10 amps. Uh, and then we're presently working to complete the uh, fixture for the dynamic cast test. Here, there's a big curiosity if we'll see the same effect of mechanical actuation that we saw in benchtop experiments where they're immediately distinguished. Uh, and there's also a curiosity that if the effect of the combined stressors um, will also be observed, maybe even at a comparable um, nature to the mechanical actuation. Uh, and then we have the option to apply additional rounds of cast like to turn up the current if, if um, there's an interest or depending on the results of the first round of testing. And then we hope to present on the comparison the results from these studies um, at the PBSC next year. So, yep, hopefully you'll remember then there's a big influence of the mechanical actuation um, that we saw in our experiments in the bench top experiments. Um, and then we used a push-pull mechanical fixture um, as part of the experiment, right? That's what was provided in the mechanical actuation. Um, there were different components that were affected in this experiment. Um, for the static assembly, they were affected at the fuse internal to the components. Once we added the actuation, this was more like at the branch connector to fuse um, junction. Um, this is also the same location. There's evidence of this in the field failed samples, right? Like where it's hot and melted and deformed is at, some, at that same location in some instances. Uh, and then how might we further validate the result? Right now we've shown a lot of the examples were for the larger um, applied deflection and then the cast experiment at a lesser deflection is pending. Um, okay, and then just some acknowledgement. So thanks to the Duramat management team. Um, the cast is a um, capital expensive um, method. And so I'm sure there's some extra effort that was done here to get some of the components, you know, the paperwork and stuff to do that. Um, thank you to our sponsor. Um, and then just a reminder to put your questions and answers and comments and stuff that will all be in the, the Q&A section in the, um, in the Zoom window. Okay. All right, thank you, David, and thank you, Peter. Um, we have a good assortment of questions. It looks like most of them are going into chat. Um, you can put them either there or uh, into the Q&A. Um, I'll try to keep up. Peter's actually been answering some questions while David's been speaking. So um, I wanna make sure I hit this question. I'll start off um, from Henry Heislemere. What is the difference from the, I why is this different from IEC 63209 tests, which I often see the glass glass perform better than the glass back sheet module. Um, and I think that's something a lot of us kind of have in the back of our head that glass glass usually performs better and it kind of stands out when it, when it doesn't. So Peter, if you can talk about how this test is different, that would be really helpful. So 63209 and I, I think maybe that's 63209-1 has 
at least five parallel sequences, uh, a therm one that's primarily thermal cycling, one that's uh, um, a sequence of static load, cyclic loading, thermal cycling, humidity freeze. Another one that's damp heat followed by UV thermal cycling, et cetera. Um, another one is 2000 hours of damp heat, um, at least a version I'm looking at. Another one's a PID test. So when Henry asks, you know, which, you know, like how does this compare to 63209? I guess my, it's a bit hard to say because hard to answer because I don't know which sequence Henry is asking about. You know, I can understand sequence four in, in 63209, which is 2000 hours of damp heat. A glass glass module will invariably look better because um, <clears throat> humidity ingress is slower. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, it's without getting into the details of which sequence of 63209 is being asked, it's, it's tough to answer. I'm sorry. Okay, I think that actually makes a lot of sense. The, the times I've seen glass glass do well, those tests have involved or do much better, have involved definitely damp heat sequences. So maybe that's answering some questions. Um, but Henry can put back in the, he can drop us a note if it's a different uh, sequence or leg that we're looking for. I'll try to keep an eye out and y'all can follow up in more detail. Um, James Ma from uh, 3M is asking, have we used CAS to test multi bus bar based modules like nine bus bars, which are becoming popular? Um, and in my head, this is really relevant to our upcoming work um, where we're trying to make sure all of our results are scalable since things change so fast. Um, so have you had a chance to look at modules with um, a lot more bus bars than normal? We're, we're than currently, we previously saw. Yeah, we're, we're currently uh, looking for suppliers of, of some that can work with us to provide four cell mini modules. If anybody here um, would like to work with us, be happy to talk. Yeah, I think this would fit in really well with Peter's uh, Duramat project that's starting this year on Interconnect. So if anybody can... Um, help us source those or can make some for us. I think that would be super interesting. Um, a question from uh, Andrea Bowring. Um, how did you choose the locations to apply vibration in the module for dynamic mechanical testing? And it's probably good to wrap this in with, there was another comment about dynamic, dynamic mechanical testing and mounting into a rack. Um, hey, well, we, we chose the, uh, the, the mounting points of the module. I think that's most representative. Uh, we can understand that if, if the, uh, the, the whole rack is vibrating, that's going to, as it does in real life under wind loads, it's going to impart those vibrations into the module there. So that's one reason. Um, but yeah, to be representative also, we're, that we're trying to also stress the mounting points such that uh, the, the edges, the wings of the module, so to speak, can, can vibrate and, and the center as well. So it's, if anybody's got any, so what we're looking to do here is be as representative as possible. And if anybody has better ideas, I'm all ears. Okay. Um, I think that makes sense. So Henry just put up in the chat, um, recent reports, most of the tests, including TC600, Dampeat 2000, and Mechanical Sequence were better in glass glass, which I think is consistent with what we've seen in other testing. Um, but I think this, these results here are indicating something a little bit different. Um, so I'm going to suggest that Henry and Peter, Peter follow up on that um, offline because there's I think there's actually a really interesting nugget there that requires um, a little bit more nuanced discussion. Um, I want to transfer over to a question for Dave, which is from Garno Oreski at the uh, Polymer Competence Center. Have you already tried the tropical setter cycle on the connectors with the acceleration factors that Peter presented before they should break, uh, as from uh, his experience? Polycarbonate is more sensitive to humidity than PET. Yeah, hey, hey thanks for the question, Gano. Um, we have run the sample assemblies through static cast, meaning we had a fixture where six samples were side by side um, and, and constrained in the fixture uh, with an applied current and all of the other stressors. There wasn't a, any evidence of undue degradation um, in that case. Um, and so we'll see how that compares once you start to apply an external mechanical actuation. Uh, again, in the benchtop experiments, there was a huge difference um, right away when we did that. 
Um, whereas in the static testimony that's held in place, there's thermal cycling um, relative to it being constrained in the fixture, um, but it's not nearly the same as like some sort of tweaking of your sample during the experiment itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, and by the way, if I butcher your question uh, or interpretation of it, um, please follow up in the chat. Um, Niall has a question about the drop in VOC at the tropical condition. Um, what does that mean since it occurs at, at both the high and low conditions? Um, and Peter mentioned something that it could be um, boron, oxygen, and LID, but I think there's a worthy comment that's, that's worth some explanation about since it was very, very small. We didn't necessarily look into it. Um, Peter, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Or Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, my best okay. guess is LID. Um, my okay. second best guess is measurement error since the degradation was less than uh, you know, one, well, on the order of uh, three quarters of 1%, 0. 0.75% um, percent relative. So uh, it's one of those, my best guess. Okay. Um, is it worth commenting on? I think one of the things we see with CAST is since it tends to um, provide stress somewhat agnostic to the mechanism you're expecting to see. Um, how often do you see, you know, these other kinds of stress or degradation phenomena other than the ones you were looking for? Well, that's a really uh, great question. Um, we, we found some kinds of PID uh, that um, of, that were a bit unexpected. Um, there's a number of, of different kinds of PID, you know, including um, the shunting, the, the polarization, the corrosion, uh, and also silicon nitride degradation, pitting, and, um, you know, maybe others. Um, so we, we've seen uh, some unexpected kinds of PID that weren't recoverable. So our best guess is, is some kind of uh, silicon nitride uh, corrosion. Other than that, you know, not too often. Um, um, we can, you know, so far we've been able to to diagnose what's going on. Uh, but to answer the question, I mean, the whole idea is is to be is to find, you know, everything, and I think we we do. Uh, there's been times where connections fail where we don't expect it. Uh, the the uh, grid finger breaking that I showed in the glass glass modules was unexpected. Um, so uh, yeah, so just to summarize here, um, while unexpected mechanisms do show up, we can usually identify them. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, Peter, I think it's also a... the case you get, you get more than one degradation mode occurring at once. Um, which might be somewhat different than the accelerated tests, the standardized tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I always think of CAST when people ask me if they should do it as uh, one of my old thermo professors said, if she wanted, if you wanted her to look and see if she made a grading mistake, she was gonna regrade the whole, mod the whole test and you never knew what she would find. Um, and there are times I feel like that's what happens when you send stuff in for CAST of like, okay, we'll look for that thing. And if we find 10 other things, that's just more information for you. Um, so I think it's a, it makes the interpretation challenging, but it's very useful information. Um, any final questions before we close out? All right, well, we are just about at time. Um, again, David and Peter are uh, available by email if you wanna hit them up with more questions or more discussion, I think there's definitely um, something more to talk about here and the differences between what we see in CAST and what we see in 63209 um, that will help us understand what's going on a lot better uh, and uh, also what we could be seeing more of in connectors. So thank you both so much. Uh, we're taking December off, so please catch all, almost all of us at the NIST UL workshop. We will all be there in attendance uh, and highly recommend that you all participate there as well. And then we'll see you again in Duramet Forum in January. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks again, Peter. Thanks, everyone.